Hello and welcome to the CTA webinar on lease renewals. This is the fourth in a series of five webinars on the leasehold property life cycle. Joining me today are two of the industry's leading experts from the legal and surveying professions, Mr. Martin McKeague of law firm Walker Morris and Paul Rayburn from Rayburn Consulting. Martin, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks, Tony. Um, yes, my name is Martin McKeague. As, as, as Tony said, I'm a partner at Walker Morris Solicitors in Leeds. I've been involved in property and property education matters for over 20 years, and I've got substantial experience in dealing with lease renewal matters, whether inside London Town at 1954 or outside um, that act. So, um, a little bit about me. Thank you, Martin. And Paul. Thanks, Tony. I'm Paul Rayburn. So I head up Rayburn Consulting <coughs> and uh, two or three other niche property consulting uh, practices. My colleagues and I act for uh, tenants throughout the United Kingdom and Ireland in uh, a whole host of property transacting matters from acquisition and disposal through rent reviews, dilapidations and lease renewals in particular, which we're discussing today. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Martin. And that's right. So today we are covering a wide variety of topics relating to lease renewals, including the types of leases that, that tenants uh, may be wanting to renew, timing, tactics. Uh, we'll be looking at some of the grounds on which a landlord might refuse to renew a lease with a tenant um, and then look more closely at some of the terms of the new lease. And if we have time, we'll be looking at procedure uh, if the lease renewal ends up going to court. Uh, we'll be taking questions along the way and hopefully leave some extra time at the end for more questions with a couple of key takeaways from the panellists. So should we start then with how businesses occupy commercial property and how their agreements may affect or limit their ability to renew? Martin, can we start with you? I mean, obviously we're concerned here with um, tenants, um, businesses and how they occupy. Typically they will occupy by way of a lease. Uh, on some occasion they will occupy by way of a licence. And there's an important distinction there because a licence won't attract the benefit of the landlord turned out 1954, whereas a tenancy will, unless it's been excluded. From the landlord turned out 1954. Um, it used to be the case that tenancies would be excluded by virtue of a court order, but that was done away with some time ago, and now essentially it's open to the landlord and the tenant to agree to exclude the tenancy subject to following a particular procedure. The distinction really is that if the tenancy is protected by the 1954 Act, then the tenant will, subject to certain grounds, have an automatic right of renewal. Um, in relation to a new tenancy, with such terms to be agreed between the landlord and the tenant or in the absence of agreement to be determined by the court. If, on the other hand, the tenancy is not protected by the 54 Act, so it's been excluded, then the tenancy will automatically determine on the lease expiry date and the tenant will have no automatic right of renewal. So in those circumstances, it will be entirely a matter for agreement between the tenant and the landlord as to whether the tenant um, takes on a new lease. So you can see that it, it's pretty important for a tenant to consider at the outset of its lease, at the beginning of the lease, whether its tenancy is going to be inside the Act or outside the Act. If you're acting for a tenant, then generally speaking, the tenancy should be inside the Act, but ultimately that's a matter for negotiation between the landlord and tenant um, at the time. So key point there really is, if it's inside the Act, you've got an automatic right to renewal. If it's outside the Act, or it's a licence, there's no automatic right to renewal. And essentially, it's a matter of agreement between you and your landlord or licensor as to whether or not you have a renewal licence or tenancy and the terms of that agreement. So it sounds pretty crucial then to, to understand on the basis <laughs> you're, you're occupying the property. Um, and if you have protection... Uh, from the Landlord and Tenant Act. How early should you be thinking about renewing your lease? Paul? So, as Martin would cover in terms of the uh, statutory parameters, uh, 
1954 Act, if we assume this is a protected tenancy in the first instance, it sets out uh, strict parameters by which the existing tenancy can be brought to an end by either side. And that involves the service of notices. Commonly, it is the landlord that serves a notice on the tenant between six and 12 months before the end of the contract, the lease expiry date. And that uh, notice, a section 25 notice as it's called, must set out um, the terms proposed for a new lease, or if a new lease is going to be objected to on one of the statutory grounds, the specific grounds, which I think uh, Martin's going to cover later on, if it's uh, being objected to a renewal lease, you must, the, the lease must state what ground or grounds, the, the notice must state what ground or grounds it's being objected to on. Uh, alternatively, the tenant can uh, take the preemptive step and request a new tenancy, which is a section 26 notice, again served six or 12 months before, ordinarily served six or 12, between six and 12 months before the lease expiry date. And the tenant would propose in that its terms that it would wish to take the new lease on. If a lease is outside of the Act, the alternative scenario that Martin was talking about then, it is simply a contract for that period in time, and there is therefore no statutory or automatic right to renewal. So the lease will end uh, on terms which might be set out in that for, for bringing it to an end, or otherwise simply by expiry, expiry of that contract. So a five-year lease, it expires in five years' time. Uh, in either situation, the tenant for its own um, business certainty or to remove uncertainty so far as is able uh, may wish to make an approach to the landlord to seek terms for renewal, propose terms for renewal, ask what length of lease they're prepared to grant and start that negotiation process going at as early a, a, a possible a stage before lease expiry and again that, that um, statutory uh, time scale of between six and 12 months uh, for those tenancies that are inside the Act might also be a sensible time period for a, a lease that's not protected by the Act, but nonetheless, about a year before expiry would perhaps be the sensible time to try and uh, commence that dialogue with your landlord. So some of our members might have heard that business tenancies that are protected by the 54 Act just continue to run after expiry. So, so should you even have to renew your lease at all? What, you know, is that a benefit or are there drawbacks? No, so that's, that's a fair on. point. So, you, you, run along. so if neither side does anything, assuming this is a protected tenancy under the 54 Act, if neither side does anything, it will indeed just continue uh, beyond the lease expiry date. So let's say we're talking to a tenant right now whose lease expired uh, back in March this year. They continue to occupy, they're paying their rent. The same terms of that lease still apply to them. So their obligations in terms of repairing, what they can use it for, et cetera, still apply as if that contract was continuing, but it's being continued by virtue of the 1954 Act. And if the tenant um, decides at any point they wish to call it a day and leave, they must serve a notice advising the landlord of that, which is a three month notice, section 27 notice, but a three month notice uh, period to bring it to an end three months after you've served it. So you're you may vacate today if you wish, but you're obligated to pay rent up until the end of that notice period. Um, and either side can at any point uh, commence negotiations to, to seek to agree terms to formalise a new lease for a specific period, or in the absence of that, instigate uh, the court proceedings under the 54 Act to determine the terms of a new tenancy. But, but you're absolutely right in, in observing that come the lease expiry date, you're not suddenly out of the premise. Neither side has done it, done anything. You're not suddenly uh, thrown out of your of your business premises, no. I think there's, a, there's a, just one important point yep. to make, um, which is that the, 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 biz, the business tenant will have an automatic right of renewal. And as Paul has explained, that the tenancy will simply continue under the Act following the expiry of the contractual term. But that is subject to the tenant being in business occupation as at the expiry date. So if, for example, the tenant has ceased trading from there, then although the lease is protected by the Act, the tenancy will determine in any event 
by a fluxion of time. So it, it is important that the tenant recognises that it has to be in business occupation as at the expired contractual term. So if it sees trading, then the tenant will determine automatically on that date. Now, in those circumstances, the tenant probably doesn't care because it sees trading, but sometimes it can be the case that although the tenant is not there, it does wish to go back into occupation at some future date, and therefore it has to recognise it needs to be in business occupation as at um, the contractual expiry date. That's a very good point, Anthony Martin, and the same therefore would apply if the tenant has sublet the premises. So yeah. they, they may therefore think, well, you know, I'm technically still occupying it, albeit I've got a subtenant in there. I would like to continue because in six months' time, when my what, what, which is the period I might extend the sublease by, in six months' time, I might be ready to go back in myself. You're not going to have that chance. As Martin no. correctly points out, you need to be physically occupying it yourself. Yeah, th there is, without getting too technical about it, that, that if in Paul's example, the subtenant was a group company of tenants. Yes, yeah. then in, in those circumstances, um, the tenancy would renew because the tenant can take the occupation of a group company as being its occupation, essentially. But if the parties are unconnected, as often they will be in a sublease scenario, then in those circumstances, the lease would determine. So we talked a little bit about notices, um, section 25, section 26 notices, and how um, landlords and tenants can serve notices to bring leases to an end and renew leases. Um, it sounds like there's some uh, critical timing involved with these notices. Um, what, what are the tactics of serving these notices, Paul? So your, your primary concerns will usually either be... Uh, business security, business certainty, so wanting a new lease for a particular period. Uh, for example, you might be about, as tenant, to uh, spend money refitting the premises. You may just have got a new contract to supply uh, uh, a, new, a new client. So you need to have certainty of occupation that is more than the three to six months you have left on your lease. And simply knowing that it will roll on, protected by the Act, isn't secure enough for you. You want at least a three or five year term, whatever. So that might be your motivation to take the steps for you to serve the notice as the tenant, the section 26 notice to start that ball rolling. But then there are other circumstances where you might choose to do nothing, to not serve notice, assuming the landlord hasn't served the notice on you. And primarily that would be if you, if the advice you get from your valuation surveyor, so my, my role as opposed to Martin's role as lawyer, if the advice you get is, look, the rent you're currently paying is, uh, is a good bit less than the property is actually worth in the open market right now. Because remember, at least in you, your rent is, is going to be reset at the current market level. So that could be a reduction in rent, of course, if rents have gone down from when you're passing rent was set. But it, similarly, it could be an increase. So if the advice of your valuation severe is that the 10, 10 or 15,000 pounds a year you're currently paying is way below where it's likely to go to in a formal lease renewal, then you might choose to simply leave that alone and take the benefit of the reduced rent for as long as you can legitimately, but nonetheless, for as long as you can get away with. Okay. And um, how can, can anyone serve a Section 26 notice? Is, is that something a lawyer should do, Martin? I, I suppose the answer to your first question is yes, anybody can serve it. Um, it would be better to instruct a lawyer to serve it or a good lawyer to serve it because it's a, it's a formal legal document and therefore then it's important that whoever is drafting it knows um, the constituent elements of what needs to, to go into it. As I say, it, it isn't a particularly complicated form, um, but um, it, it is something which, yes, you, you should instruct a solicitor to, to serve that for you. You can also serve another notice at the same time called the Section 40 notice, which um, allows you to identify who is your competent landlord for the purpose of serving the Section 26 um, request. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think what Paul, what Paul says is, is, is absolutely correct that, I mean, generally speaking, if the rent is going down, then as a tenant, you should be getting on and serving your Section 26 request as soon as possible if, if the rent is going up. Probably not a great deal of 
um, advantage in the tenant getting on with that. Equally, from a tenant's perspective, you might be quite happy to let things just carry on with you continuing under the Act because you can exit the property at any point by giving not less than three months' notice by serving a Section 26, 27 notice. But let's say uh, you're the tenant and you've served your Section 26 notice asking for a new lease and the landlord turns around and says, well, I don't want to give you a new lease. What, what are the tenant's rights in that situation, Martin? Well, it, it, the, the, the landlord, so if the tenant serves a Section 26 request, the landlord has two months within which to serve a formal ground of opposition. If it fails to do so, then the landlord no longer has the ability to refuse to grant the tenant a new tenancy. The only debate then is what are the terms of that new tenancy? Now, in terms of the grounds of opposition that the landlord can rely upon, these break down into two distinct categories. One is fault-based grounds. So those are grounds where the tenant is actually alleged to be in default in relation to the performance of tenant covenants. So those are, um, those are default grounds in relation to the repair and maintenance of the holding, persistent delay in paying the rent, and the third ground is in relation to breach of other covenants um, under the tenancy. The second category of grounds of opposition um, are non-fault-based grounds. Um, those cover situations where, for example, the landlord wishes to redevelop the property, which is the most common ground relied upon, where the landlord is able to prove that it can provide the tenant with suitable alternative accommodation, um, the third ground um, is where um, a particularly um, unusual and rare ground is in relation to um, subletting of the premises where effectively the premises are sublet and the landlord can achieve a better rent by doing away with the sublettings and granting um, um, a head lease in relation to the various um, premises. Um, and then the final ground of opposition is where the landlord wishes to use the premises for its own business purposes. Um, the, the fault based grounds are um, often thrown in by landlords um, simply because they have the advantage of meaning the landlord doesn't have to pay statutory compensation, whereas the second category of non-compensation, sorry, of non-fault based grounds mean that um, in those circumstances, if proven and without the landlord being able to prove a fault based ground, the landlord would have to pay to the tenant such a compensation based on the rateable value. And that will either be one times rateable value or two times rateable value, depending upon whether the tenant or the business occupier operated by the tenant has been in existence of 14 years or more. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that in, in the current climate, um, what I'm hearing um, from various clients is that they're um, certainly from tenant clients particularly down in the southeast is that there's quite a lot of um, redevelopment going on down there and therefore there's quite a lot of termination natives being served by landlords relying upon for example the redevelopment ground and seeking to twin that as well with a, um, a fault-based ground. So if a landlord simply decides that he, he wants the tenant out so he can take advantage by getting in a new tenant that he might prefer. Can he just say, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to redevelop the building, so uh, see you later? Well, <laughs> I suppose that, that he, he can try and do that. And I suppose that does happen from time to time. But, but obviously, if the tenant was to contest that, then the matter would be the subject of court litigation. The landlord would have to sign a witness statement, would have to give all evidence, and obviously if it turned out um, that he'd misrepresented the position, then the landlord can then be liable in damages. And indeed, I think there is a provision in, in the Act uh, which deals with misrepresentation, and which would, I think, potentially allow, the, um, allow the, um, the court to then order damages, perhaps even set the order aside. So um, in, in theory, Tony, yes, the landlord could do that. Does it happen? Yes, I'm, I'm sure it does. But um, it, 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 yeah, if, if the tenant is prepared to challenge and interrogate the ground of opposition properly, and that obviously comes at a cost, then I, I think it would be pretty difficult 
um, for the landlord to to be able to successfully argue that ground, despite the fact that actually had no intention to redevelop at all. And let's say then that um, the landlord's not opposing the renewal, and um, he says to the tenant, "Look, you know, let's let's not bother with all that um, notice provision. Here's the new lease. The rent's going up. Um, if you sign this lease, then." Um, you know, I'll give you this new lease for five years and everyone's happy, aren't they? Um, and you're not happy because the rent looks excessive. Um, can you still serve a notice? What, what would be the, the right tactic in that situation, Paul? Surely you don't have to accept the rent that the landlord proposes. No, not at all. So I think now would be a good time to talk a bit more generically and move it away from leases that are necessarily protected by the Act. Because uh, I think there has been a steady but, but nonetheless inexorable uh, move towards leases being outside of the Act, contracted out of the 54 Act protection. Martin's absolutely right, and, and what we said earlier is correct, in that given a choice, and certainly if, if the advice was sought of either Martin or I, to any tenant, it would be to ensure your lease is inside the Act. But if it's not, it is seldom uh, to your real disadvantage in practice. Uh, and the analogy I would use in that regard is uh, in, in my home country, in Scotland, for example, where I, I know there are CTA members, there is no equivalent of that Landlord and Tenant Act 1954. So at the end of your tenancy, your business tenancy in Scotland, that is the end and you negotiate a new one, landlord and tenant, in theory, on a level playing field. So uh, seldom is there, have I ever come, in my entire career, seldom have, have I come across a situation north or south of the border where a tenant is, is truly ransomed by the landlord as to the terms of a new lease. Normally, it simply comes down to uh, your relative strengths of negotiating position, i.e., the, the skills or otherwise of your respective advisors in, in negotiating the terms of that lease. So the answer to your question is therefore no, you don't have to accept what is proposed. It's simply that in England and Wales, if you have a tenancy that is inside the Act, your ultimate uh, uh, sanction, if you like, or your ultimate remedy is if terms can't be agreed, then the matter will uh, in theory go to the county court to be decided. Very few lease renewals relative to the number that occur these days end up in the county court. Um, they are either negotiated to settlement between advisors or between parties direct, or in the alternative, go to a form of arbitration, <coughs> which is uh, <coughs> just as binding, excuse me, just as binding as a court's decision, but is less expensive and less stressful than going to court. And that arbitration is a, a scheme that's run by the RICS, Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors, and I would say more cases revert to and are resolved by that route than actually end up in court. But overall, the sub substantial majority, inside or outside of the Act, are negotiated to settlement. I think okay, one so, point to make, yeah. Tony, is that, as, as Paul says, that the overwhelming majority get settled. I think when I started out 20 years ago, sort of lease renewal work, probably form maybe 30, 40% of what we did as property litigators. It now probably forms nearer to maybe 10% um, of what we do. But one of the main reasons for that is that um, parties are now able to agree to extend the deadlines for making court applications, whereas before you, you didn't have that ability. So once you've served, once you'd served a section 25 or served a section 26 request, um, then um, you had to make an application to court if you hadn't agreed and completed terms by the termination date. You can now extend those dates by agreement. So that took away a lot of the work. Um, and I think also, as Paul says, there's, there's probably a greater willingness now on tenants and landlords to come to an agreement on terms. It's pretty unusual for lease renewals to get anywhere near to court in my experience. Um, and therefore, then I think that the 54 Act probably has less resonance at the moment than it did 20 years ago. But who knows? I mean, it's all about supply and demand, isn't it? If 
if demand exceeds supply, then the 54 Act will become far more um, pertinent again, um, whereas at the moment, certainly in retail, for example, then supply um, quite clearly exceeds demand at the moment. Thanks, Martin. We've talked a little bit about agreeing the new rent in the lease. Um, obviously, landlords and tenants will have a different view on that, and it will be up to their advisors um, to advise each party and then a period of negotiation. Um, but there are there are other covenants um, in the lease, and um, I just wondered whether we could talk a little bit about some of the key covenants that... Um, may carry through into the new lease if it's a 54 Act renewal um, or whether there's any opportunity to renegotiate some of the terms of the lease, um, of the renewed lease. Um, Paul. So I think Martin and I will both have some plenty to say on this so I'll try and keep my brief. Um, so the starting point certainly uh, if it's a 54 Act lease, the starting point is that the terms will be similar to, but no more onerous than those under the existing lease. And that's a two-way thing. Um, so that is the starting point. Terms being modernised as a term often used or varied. Well, you know, modernisation isn't necessarily something to be scared of. They can suit both sides, modernisations and lease clauses, if they make them less burdensome uh, or to remove clauses that are simply not relevant to the nature of your occupation. So uh, leases can be varied and altered uh, from expiry into lease renewal. All that said, some things to perhaps be aware of is that um, terms that are obviously more burdensome for you as tenant cannot be imposed on you or are highly unlikely to be imposed should the matter end up in a court or at arbitration. So a simple example of that might be... Um, changing your repairing obligations. So this has been a common theme through our uh, webinars is uh, tenants perhaps underestimating the extent of the burden, burden that they carry in terms of their repairing obligations, the ultimate uh, point at which that comes home to roost being at lease expiry and dilapidations if you're not renewing the lease. And of course, that's next uh, the next and last webinar in this series. So if you currently occupy your lease and your, your responsibility is only for internal repairs and decorating and the landlord covers the covers the rest and doesn't charge it back to you. There is no service charge. So you, you as a tenant are responsible for the inside, landlord for the outside. And at least in you, the landlord is trying to vary the terms to place a, a, an entire responsibility to repair upon you, either directly that you're responsible for the outside as well, or to introduce a service charge that is effectively making you responsible for the outside as well. That is an obviously more onerous term and varying the terms of your lease. So that is unlikely to succeed at the landlord's behest in court unless it can be shown that it's at least adequately reflected in the rental that is being attached to that lease. So in simple terms, if for an internal, internal repairing only lease, the market evidence shows that the rental would be £20,000 a year, um, uh, for internal repairing only, but if it's full repairing, the evidence shows from the comparable evidence that it would be £15,000, then it needs to be adjusted accordingly. In other words, not, not for one party to have their cake and eat it. So terms can be adjusted, but so long as it is properly reflected in the rental that then attaches to it. So rent that is negotiated by the, the valuation surveyor is, is a function both of open market rental evidence, other transactional evidence, but also the precise nature of the lease terms. You know, not all other things being equal, more owner, a, a, a property, so two identical properties, one with more onerous terms for the tenant than the other, is likely to attract less of a rent in the open market for self-evident reasons. Sure. Martin, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I think, as Paul said, the starting point in relation to a lease inside the Act is, is the current lease. Um, obviously, if the lease is outside the Act, then basically everything is up for grabs because the landlord is not bound by the terms. Neither is the tenant bound to accept the terms. But if, if we're talking leases inside the Act, the starting point is the existing lease and the burden is on the party proposing the change to demonstrate that the change is fair and reasonable in all the circumstances. 
I think where we probably see the most um, argument and debate is around the length of term. At the moment, typically it would be a landlord arguing for a longer term, tenant arguing for a shorter term. Um, it, it can arise sometimes where, for example, the landlord wants to redevelop, the landlord might want a shorter term and the tenant might want a longer term. But in, in the current climate, certainly flexibility is king, isn't it? And tenants are pushing for terms. I think when I started, it was probably moving to a sort of standard five year cycle, probably now. Certainly certain retailers we talk to, it's down to three years. Um, they don't want to commit for longer than that. And landlords obviously would prefer a longer term because you know, provides a greater investment value. We can get arguments as well over breaks, um, break options in, in that context, in, in that the tenant might be prepared to commit to a five-year term that says, I want a rolling break um, every 12 months. Equally, the landlord might want a rolling break. And, and generally speaking, the, the court will not order the tenant to take a lease for longer than it wants. Obviously, there's a, a balancing exercise between the competing interests of landlord and tenant, but going to be unusual for a tenant um, to be ordered, um, so for the court to order the tenant take a lease for longer than it actually um, wants. And, and generally speaking, the way that the court rationalises the competing interests is if the tenant wants a shorter term, well, it can pay for that flexibility by a higher rent. Um, and indeed, that's, that's the way generally the court rationalises a lot of these points where the tenant will want greater flexibility, the landlord will want greater control. And the court strikes a balance by um, reflecting those terms, the level of rent that the tenants required to pay. So, you know, given that there are complications um, and costs associated with renewing your lease, surely a, a short cycle of lease renewals uh, might be disadvantageous to the tenant. You know, would they be better then to argue for um, break clauses as as opposed to a short lease? Um, yeah, I, I, I suppose that the, the tenant arguing for a three-year term faces a renewal in three years, doesn't it? Whereas the tenant might take a 10-year term with, the, with breaks at three and six years, then it can elect at year three, year six, or shortly before that, whether it wants to exercise the break. So yeah, that's, that's a good point, Tony, that that flexibility would avoid the need to go through that renewal process at years three and six um, if, if you build in break options into a longer term. Um, Martin, you mentioned earlier um, in terms of the, the negotiation process under the 54 Act at least um, that landlords and tenants can agree to extend that period of negotiation giving them a bit mm -hmm. more breathing space and and hopefully time to to agree uh, a new lease without going to court. Um, that, that raises the issue of interim rents, I think, and it's not something we've, we've talked about. I know we've talked about the rent in the new lease. Can you just explain exactly what an interim rent is, Martin? Yeah, I mean, I suppose it might be easy to start with, with the situation where an interim rent won't arise. So if, for example, the current lease ends on the, um, the 30th of March and the new lease starts um, next day, then in those circumstances we, there will be no interim rent because there is no interim period. If, on the other hand, the new lease um, start say six months after the old lease expires you've got that interim period haven't you there of, of six months so the question is what should the interim rent be for that period and and if we're under the 54 act and it's only under the 54 act that an interim rent is capable of being awarded the, the default position is that the interim rent um, will generally speaking be the rent payable under the new lease that there are certain grounds and circumstances in which the interim rent um, could be different, but generally the default position will be that the interim rent um, is um, that payable um, um, under the new lease. Um, the, the, there's a certain amount of tactics involved in that the 
it, an interim rent, for example, could only be claimed by a landlord from the earliest date it could have specified for termination its Section 25 notice. So from, from that perspective, there is sense in the landlord getting on with things if the rent is going up, for the same reason the sense in the tenant getting on with things if the rent is going down. Um, but obviously from a tenant's perspective, if the rent is going up, there's not a great deal of impetus, is there? For the, for the tenant to really be getting on with that process unless, for example, it fears that um, the market is inexorably moving upwards and therefore it would like to lock in a correspondingly lower rent now rather than let the process drag out for another couple of years by which then it may be locked into an even higher rent. Okay. Paul, did you have anything to add about interim rents before we, we move on? Well, I think Martin has covered it comprehensively. I mean, the reality is that uh, in negotiations these days, I think interim rents uh, feature far less because there, there generally has become, whether or not it's inside or outside of the Act, has generally become uh, a fairly normal practice of the new lease commences. When you agree it, it might be a bit later than when the old lease expired. And rightly or wrongly, whatever rent was payable up to that point under the old lease is just kind of left alone. So there's more of a, I do find in practice, there's more of a bit of a fudged deal and the concern focuses more on the terms of the new lease and when that will start. So the interim rents become less of an issue. Obviously when there are bigger sums of money involved and if it was a significant reduction in rent, for example, then you would be right to, to pursue that for the tenant. But, but generally, the, the, the differences in the grand scheme of the overall negotiations are, are fairly de minimis and therefore it's, it's not that material. Sure. So I guess generally then, we, we spoke about the negotiating strengths of the parties earlier. Um, when, you, when you're approaching lease renewal or when you're raising the issue of renewing the lease with the landlord, what sort of things can we expect landlords to throw into the mix when, you know, when a tenant requests a new to renew his lease? Um, is it likely that the landlord will start to pull the tenant up on some of his repairing obligations? Is that the sort of thing we, we tend to see at lease renewal? So, yeah, um, th that's not uncommon. And I, th I think you've triggered in, in the back of my mind there, Tony, which is worth throwing in, quite often a lease, this is not a standard term, but it's, it's not unusual, quite often a lease will allow a landlord to erect a to-let board on the property in the period running up to lease expiry, so three to six months before expiry. It's something that isn't done that often, but when it is, it tends to um, uh, deeply discomfort the tenant, understandably, because they mm. see this to-let board going up on their property. It's, uh, in my experience, more often tactical than not, and uh, is, is for the landlord to come along and say, look, I've had an offer of this for the property. So uh, even though they know they can't throw you out if you're a protected tenant, is to say, look, I've had an offer of this amount. It's an offer. It means nothing. It's not really evidence. So it's a, it's a brief aside, but a relevant aside. If, la if there is that right for the landlord to stick a board on the property and they do so, don't don't overreact or be overly emotional about it. It's a tactical thing. In terms of repairs, yes, very often a landlord will say, look, um, I've looked around the property, you have an obligation to keep it in repair, it's bloody awful, I need all these things putting right. Well, if you're renewing the lease on much the same repairing terms as before, then it's it's there's no loss, there's no uh, consequence for the landlord because they will ultimately get you at the expiry of the next lease when you eventually vacate the property. Um, it may, of course, be an opportunity for the tenant to counter and say, well, actually, um, I appreciate I have to pay you a contribution to the, towards repairing the roof, but, but the lease provides that that's your obligation, your responsibility to do so. And you're quite right, the roof is leaking. So can you honour your obligations and fix the roof? And yes, I appreciate I'll be paying my proportionate share of that. So these are all issues that are ironed out in negotiations, and often they are advanced in a relatively uh, um, aggressive way to, to try to, uh, I suppose, uh, intimidate or cajole a particular level of settlement. But if you're receiving the right advice and, you're, and you have the right representation, these things will be countered 
successfully on your behalf. I mean, one, one point to make, which um, is, is sometimes argued, is that particularly if the property is um, significantly dilapidated, the, the court does have the ability to make it a term of the new tenancy that the tenant carry out certain specific works within a period of time um, under the new tenancy. And, and obviously then if the tenant defaults, then the landlord will have the usual remedies it would have anyway in relation to tenant defaults, which is forfeiture, um, application for specific performance, and possibly even stepping rights to the work itself and then recover the cost from, from the tenant. So that, that, that does arise, and I, I've seen that argued and successfully um, argued, so that, that, that is a point worth, um, worth bearing in mind. Uh, um, similar points might resonate as well in relation to you might have a situation whereby the, the current lease is guaranteed um, and say, well, um, yeah, the guarantor should fall away now because we've successfully business from the premises for five years or so, we don't need that anymore. So the court can't actually order a third party um, stand as guarantor. What it can do is it can still put a provision in the lease to say within a tenants to procure a suitable guarantor and obviously again if, if the tenant doesn't comply with the obligation then it's in breach and, and the usual landlord remedies apply. Thanks Martin. So I think at this stage uh, if anyone in the audience has any questions then by all means send them through and we'll try to answer them as best we can. Um, I think that that's that's a good point on guarantors Ma Martin. I think one of the other issues that may crop up at least renewal is where tenants have rent deposits and whether or not uh, they should continue into the new lease what what tends to be the position on rent deposits at lease renewal um well i i suppose if it's outside the act it's a matter of commercial negotiation again if if you know if the tenant's been in the premises for a significant period of time to discharge a tenant covenants and you might say well the rent deposit should fall away that's not needed anymore I don't think in a 54 Act context, I don't think the court has the ability to order a rent deposit. I can't see that it would do. I don't think I've ever seen a court order the provision we put into a lease to say the tenant's got to provide a, a rent deposit. Um, I, I suspect that for that reason, if additional fortification was still thought to be needed, the court is more likely to deal with that by way of um, a provider in the lease to say the tenants to provide a, a guarantee and the tenant might think to itself well in those circumstances instead of having to provide a guarantee I'll just we'll just roll over the rent deposit or we'll just adjust the rent deposit a little bit. Sure sure so again it might be another opportunity for negotiation I guess. At, yeah I mean the these, these things yeah they, they you know as I say um, as I say 99% is probably even higher than that of these matters get get resolved by agreement it, it's um I, I i think the 54 act is there it provides a structure it provides a focus and it and it, it helps iron out creases in the negotiations which perhaps wouldn't be ironed out but for the court process because people often think i don't want to spend tens of thousands of pounds litigating over these issues let's just come to something we can both live with sure okay i'm just going to pick up on a question that we've had from the audience and it goes back to something I, I mentioned before um, when we're talking about grounds of opposition. What rights does a tenant have to contest the grounds of opposition if they believe the landlord is using it as a way of getting the tenant out of the property? Well, I, I mean, I suppose the grounds of opposition are a means of getting the tenant out of the property in, in, a, in, in a very basic sense. I think probably what the question is directed at is when the grounds relied upon are not bona fide um, and essentially they were sham. So your example, Tony, given earlier, wasn't it, that if the landlord's saying it's intended to redevelop, but it's not really, it actually just has a better tenant lined up who would prefer to let the property to, then, as I said earlier in, in, in this session, that the tenant has the opportunity to contest that ground. The landlord will have to give evidence, it will have to sign statements of truth, it will you know, have to be cross-examined on that evidence. Um, and obviously, if the court isn't satisfied that there is a genuine intention to redevelop, for example, well then, 
the ground up position won't be made out, the tenant will be entitled to a new tenancy. I mean, obviously all that comes at a cost mm. and a significant cost in taking any matter to trial. If the tenant is successful um, and the landlord's ground of opposition is, is rejected, then it will typically be entitled to costs. Um, I must say, in, in, in my experience, um, I, I think most landlords, when relying upon um, non-fault-based grounds, are being genuine. It, it, and, and I think they're being genuine as well because it, it's, it's not a zero-sum game for landlord. If, if they're successful, and they can't prove a fault-based ground, they're going to have to pay statutory compensation, and that compensation can often be substantial um, sums of money. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the, the, the short answer to the point is that the tenant has the opportunity to challenge, interrogate, contest that through the, through the court process. And just on some of the other grounds, say, for the landlord wanting to occupy the premises himself, what, what's stopping him from, from saying that? And, you know, is there any restriction on him or does he have to do certain things in terms of occupying the property himself? Again, no. I mean, they would have to sign statements of truth in relation to the pleading, in relation to the witness statement. Obviously, if it turns out that it's a sham, then they would be um, they'd be liable in misrepresentation. They could be sued in damages. Um, I, I think... Uh, I'm sure it does go on, but I, I think it, it's pretty unusual i think for landlords particularly if you got to the stage of having to sign statements of truth in relation to witness evidence and things to actually misrepresent the position that's not to say there aren't shades of gray um in, involved in these things but um it's um i mean ultimately as i say the the tenant can challenge these things they can interrogate these things um and it, it i think it takes something for person to go to court to give live evidence and effectively to lie in, in, in those circumstances that yeah. that would be a pretty bold move and equally a tenant's got to have a very strong suspicion that something's amiss well, there's a c- couple Absolutely. of things i would add uh, if, if i may chaps um on the on the own occupation front correct me if i'm wrong here martin but uh there certainly used to be a provision that if you object to renewal on the grounds of uh, wishing to occupy yourself as landlord, you must have owned the property for at least five years. Yeah, and, still the case. And of course, that, that is an important one to be aware of. So I, I've come across a few situations, uh, sadly, where the tenants had their leases excluded from the act, so they did not enjoy this protection, where the property was bought with the sole intention that the, the, the purchaser was going to install their new business in there and benefit effectively, steal the goodwill that the tenant had already created. It commonly happens in, in uh, takeaway food type businesses. Uh, pizza delivery in, in particular have come across it. So uh, it is very important to be aware that uh, if, you, if you are 54 Act protected and you know your landlord only bought it a couple of years ago and now they're objecting to renewal on the grounds of their own occupation, they will fail, and there is indeed that statutory provision. What I would, the, the second point I, w- I would make is, you know, often if there is a spurious or 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 poorly composed uh, ground of opposition, a robustly and competently worded letter from a solicitor on your behalf will snuff it out at first instance. I, I do find that, that. So, for example, on that uh, five years occupation thing, or uh, on the basis that it, there's disrepair, uh, a suitably worded solicitor's letter will effectively kill what is either an, a poorly advised or opportunistic uh, attempt at opposing renewal. So it's not necessarily going to end up in court. I think we should make that point that, you know, you're not, you don't need to have shed loads of money to defend your position against what you fir- firmly believe is an opportunistic uh, attempt at getting you out. Okay, thanks for that Paul. I think we've got time for one more question before we wrap up. Um, this is a, a very sort of context specific question, um, practical question. Um, so one of our uh, members of the audience has a tendency at will um, 
they've been in occupation of a local council property for over 15 years. Uh, the council is now insisting that they take another fixed six-year lease outside of the 54 Act, fully repairing, increasing the rent, service charge, maintenance, etc. And they're wondering, where do they stand? Um, well, if it is genuinely a tenancy at will, then not in a very good position because a tenancy at will can be determined at will. So essentially, I mean, obviously we're talking about the council here, so councils aren't typically sort of aggressive or avaricious in their approach, but um, in theory, they could just terminate tenancy at will. You'd have a reasonable period of time to vacate. You know, it might only be a, a matter of a few weeks. Um, and essentially they may then say, well, you, you, you take our offer or you, you leave it. You don't really have much of a negotiating position. If on the other hand, it wasn't really a tenancy, it really was a periodic tenant protected by the 54 Act, then you come back to the discussion that we've just had for the last hour about the fact you'd have an automatic right of renewal. So I think mm. the, the advice really would be to, to get some advice as to whether it really is a tenancy at will, mm. or is it actually a, a periodic tenancy, because that, that could make a world of difference. Because there may be an issue around the length of time that, that these guys have been occupying the property. 15 years sounds like a very long tenancy at will, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, tenancy at will are generally short-term arrangements designed to cover, for example, um, the hiatus between taking occupation and new lease being granted or during a period of negotiation. I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying it can't happen, that it could subsist for 15 years, but um, it sounds to me as if at, at some point it's probably, um, it, it's probably become a periodic tenancy and therefore then they'd be in a much a far stronger position than they are now. Well, assuming mm. it's a tenancy at will. So it certainly sounds like one in which they should take quite urgent legal and professional advice. Paul, do you have any final comments on that one? No, I agree. I, I think uh, on the face of it, it does sound unlikely or improbable that it's a tenancy at will. Not impossible, just improbable. So yes, they, they need to get advice from uh, a lawyer, a lawyer experienced in this kind of uh, specialist property matter. Okay. Right. Well, just to wrap up then, um, we have our final webinar on dilapidations on the 17th of November. Um, I hope you've enjoyed uh, this webinar on lease renewals today. Um, before we leave it, I'm just going to ask the panellists if they have one key takeaway from the topic today on lease renewals. Paul. Thank you, Tony. Um, my key takeaway, as usual, would be get professional advice uh, because the old adage by trying to save money, you waste money almost invariably applies. Uh, and leading in to next week's, uh, sorry, a fort fortnight from now, the last webinar in this series, it is sometimes argued or hoped for that uh, in lease renewal negotiations, as well as rent review, there might be some discount for the poor condition of the property, which the tenant occupies under a full repairing lease. And of course there will not be. Uh, a lease renewal will assume that you have complied with your covenants. So you may not have done, and it may be in fairly poor order, but the assumption is that it's in good repair. So the rent that attaches to it will reflect that assumption. So um, that, will, that, that observation feeds into the dilapidations that we'll be talking about in a couple of weeks' time. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Paul. And Martin, do you have one key takeaway on the subject of lease um, rules? As, as, well, as often I, I agree with entirely with what Paul has, has said, that get some proper legal advice on professional advice, because you know, I think he said trying to save money often is cost yourself money. I, I think um, in, in addition to that, um, lease renewals are often considered at least expiring. So think about these things well in advance. Don't just leave it to the last minute because that then doesn't allow you to take um, fresh advice um, and to then prepare for what's, what's going to happen. So act in a, in a timely fashion. Don't leave things until the last minute. Yeah, I think, uh, I think I'd agree with, with both of those points. Um, and certainly on that last point, Martin, it's always worth trying to establish the landlord's intentions quite early on. 
um, and yeah. that may shape your entire strategy for the building and your business. Okay, so we're going to leave it there and we're going to see everyone uh, on the 17th of November for the final instalment of the leasehold property life cycle um, on dilapidations and Paul and Martin will be joining us again. Thank you very much. Thank you.